my primary activity at Boston IVF is to conduct research and we do a lot of, uh, we tr go from basic research right through to translational research. Embryos are, as we know from this conference, are quite amazing things. Embryos undergo this switch in metabolism uh, and as I said, they're a bit schizophrenic, but the other cells that actually do that are metastatic cancers. So cancers actually undergo this switch when they actually become metastatic. So even, you know, we're, we're very interested, obviously, being in the field of IVF to study the way embryos metabolise. There are other aspects of uh, understanding embryo metabolism that we can actually uh, take into other fields and understand why cancers go out of control whereas a, an embryo obviously is not uh, going out of control, but has the ability to maintain this switch for the rest of its life, basically. Culture media has, is very different from when we first began. Uh, we had a wonderful lecture earlier on by Rusty Poole telling us about the history of IVF. Uh, right at the infancy of IVF, we, we basically stole culture media from uh, what we knew from cell culture, so they were not really developed for embryos. Uh, and then slowly these morphed into more specialised media uh, for embryo culture and there were a lot of people that were uh, leaders in the field in doing that. And a lot of that stemmed from what I spoke about last time about embryo metabolism. So as we understood what the embryo's needs were, we, we also were able to tweak the, the embryo culture media to change. And, and it went from a basic salt solution, really, a, what's called a Krebs Ringer's bicarbonate salt solution, to actually being, uh, there were some amazing studies in the late 60s by McLaren, uh, Henry Lisa's groups, Bob Edwards himself, that understood that you had to sort of uh, feed this met metabolic switch if you want. So once we understood that, these simple media started taking uh, different aspects of development and they, they developed into more complete media. Uh, there was studies in the early 90s adding in vitamins, amino acids. We understood how these vitamins and amino acids helped. We understood initially that uh, we, we needed to cater for the early embryo and then the later embryo, so we developed sequential media. And then the, the logistics side of, say, IVF took part, so we, we actually have now mostly using media which are what we call one step. So it sort of caters for everything if you want. So we, a lot of labs use uh, one-step media, so from day one right through to, to, um, to, to blastocyst development. Uh, some, some still like the idea of sequential media, catering for the different uh, aspects of embryo development. But I think in the future, we will, we will probably use the more dynamic systems uh, with the advent of things like microfluidics, where you can actually cater for the changes the embryo undergoes as it's developing, and that'll be a much easier way. So I can see, even now we're at a, a one-step media, I can see in the future that we'll probably maybe go back to a, a media that, uh, that allows the embryo to, to to sort of be catered for each of its, each of its steps. Uh, the one thing we're incredibly lucky is that the, the human embryo is very plastic. So obviously this, uh, this fluid that we use, this water-based liquid uh, that we used in, in culture media, is very different from what it sees in the fallopian tube and the uterus. But it still is able to develop. We get millions of pregnancies. Uh, so the, the, the benefit is that the embryo is very plastic in, in, in what it needs, but actually we are getting better at, at developing culture media and I hope in the future they'll be much, much better and probably very different to what we use today. So it's a quite complicated uh, lecture title, but I'll try to do my best to explain everything about culture media. Uh, first, I'd really like to thank uh, Sheila and Nabil for the invitation and, and all the people behind the scenes that, uh, that do this invitation. So a little bit about the first five days of everyone here's life, basically. What happens? So a lot happens that we sort of we visualise down the microscope. We have these amazing videos that my, my medical director, Michael Alper, calls pornography for embryologists whenever he sees videos, and I love that. I want to publish a paper saying that, but I might not actually do it. So, but a lot actually happens here. So, you know, one of the first things we know is there's a transition from this reliance on the mother with purely maternal messenger RNA to embryonic transcription. And this happens in nearly all mammalian embryos. And in the, in the human, it's been shown to happen between the four to eight cell stage. So this, this amazing video of development in the first five days, you know, we see these images and we see these lovely embryos developing, but behind the scenes, the embryo is doing these incredibly complicated things. And I'm gonna go through some of those complicated things.
You have to remember that all these complicated things have to be supported by what we grow them in. So, this is just a quick summary of some of the complicated things they do. And what we've learned many, many years ago, and Rusty gave a, a great presentation earlier about some of the pioneers that worked on this, is the embryo is a little bit schizophrenic in the way it uses its metabolism. And one of the things that it does, you know, we, we've actually shown that sperm actually like to have a little bit of glucose around, but then the early embryo actually changes the way it metabolizes. And this was fundamental in the way we created culture media many, many, many years ago. So one of the first thing it does is it actually relies mostly on pyruvate and lactate in the early stages. And then it has this switch where it goes to using glucose or glycolysis as its main energy source. And this is, I just show this because David Gardner always shows this just to confuse everybody. Uh, and he could probably name all the molecules in this, but I, I can't. Uh, so in the early stage, it's undergoing, in the cleavage stage, it's undergoing the tribocarboxylic cycle. It's using pyruvate and lactate as its main energy source. And then it switches completely and basically for the rest of its life to, to glucose-based metabolism. It's very interesting because the, the actual other cells that do this are metastatic cancers. So cancer cells do this also, and they have this switch, and the difference obviously is a cancer is uncontrollable, sadly, but the embryo has this ability to control this switch in metabolism. So it's a, it's a peripheral area of research that a lot of people interested in this, uh, in this, in this area show. So this is the classic um, graph that was shown many years ago. I thought this was going to work, but you can see here, up to the eight cell stage, you have this reliance on, on pyruvate as a metabolic source. It, it decreases, and then you get this increase in glucose metabolism. And, that, and this is seen in nearly all mammalian embryos, and it's a phenomenon that's really intrigued us how it's controlled in that. But as I said, it's fundamental to the embryo culture media we use. And it even gets more complicated than that, because the body knows that this is what it needs to do. So in the fallopian tube, if you look at the fallopian tube, you can see the embryo goes these dramatic changes in the energy sources, but the actual fallopian tube, it knows it, it, it actually has to do these types of things. So it actually has this gradient within it from fallopian tube to the uterus. There's an oxygen gradient and the embryo is actually being prepared to actually undergo implantation. And you can see this decrease in it is decrease in reliance to the Krebs cycle, this reliance on glucose, and this decrease in oxygen concentrations that it sees actually as it develops. So why am I talking about all this? So one of the reasons is that we, for many years, didn't quite understand this, and we, we actually started understanding this in the early 90s, and we changed the way we grow our embryos. So a lot of the embryos that we grow now are reliant on these changes. And I'm going to talk about the old days and the newer days and, and hopefully what, how we're going to culture embryos in the future. So these are the types of embryo culture media we, we're familiar with. Of course, we had the first media, which were actually amazingly based on just Krebs ringers bicarbonate, of like basically six or seven salts that we threw pyruvate, lactate and glucose into and got births. So all the first, a lot of the first pregnancies were actually in this very simple media. And it, I think Rusty mentioned it before, it just shows we're actually incredibly lucky in IVF, in human IVF in particular, that the embryo has a lot of plasticity in actually trying to get to its ultimate aim of, of becoming a live birth. So people also looked at complex tissue culture media, and I was glad Rusty showed a photo of, of his Menizo there, who had the first Menizo's B2 media that was used a lot in Europe. And then we went to this sequential media, which makes a lot of sense because you're, you're catering for this shift that the embryo undergoes. So you're going from the cleavage stage to the blastocyst stage. But then we had the one-step media, which sort of was like a one thing fits all type thing. So it had a mix of, of pyruvate, lactate and glucose. But as I said before, the embryo is so plastic that it actually, it does really well in it. So what's the basis for the, for the sequential culture media? So, Grosso modo, basically cleavage culture media, pronuclear to eight cell stage. There's very low glucose or no glucose at all in some. High pyruvate and lactate, EDTA, which is like a complete lecture and has to do with a thing that many of us suffered for many years with mice, with, uh, called the two cell block. And then, and then we found that there's actually a particular mix of amino acids that needs to be in. And actually the, the cleavage culture media preferred non-essential non amino acids. 
Obviously, as the embryo gets more complex, it's undergoing differentiation, it starts developing more of an adult phenotype, if you want. It needs glucose, it needs high, low pyruvate and lactate because it's not reliant on those as much anymore, and needs the full complement of essential amino acids. So that's, that's sort of the basic levels of, of your sequential culture media. And as I said before, if you actually look at the initial media, basically you can count on nearly one hand, or one and a half hands, how many components were in there. And what, what still fascinates me today is how many babies were born from these culture media, how simple they are, and how it seems that the, the embryo can go into automatic, basically, to survive, even with, its simple, with these simple culture media. And this, if you're, if you're a bit of an embryo media geek, the, a number of papers have been published that actually characterise the type of culture media we use today. And this, this is actually the composition of sequential media. And you can see most of them follow the pattern of low, low glucose and then changing over to higher glucose in, in the cleavage, in the, from the cleavage to the blastocyst media and vice versa from, uh, for, for lactate and pyruvate. So they all follow this, this type of uh, pattern, if you want. Uh, slightly different levels if you if you want to look at them, but all have this basic phenomenon of low glucose to high glucose, high pyruvate lactate to lower pyruvate lactate. But then a lot of the single step media came along, and as I said before, they cater amazingly well to to the way our blastocysts develop. In in many studies, some of the early studies showed that actually blastocysts developed even faster in some of these mediums. And, and a lot of this was thanks to John Biggers and, the, and his foresight in using these simplex methods for developing media. So that's where we are now. We have this basic understanding of embryo metabolism. We, we know we can sort of cheat the system a little bit by using one-step media very efficiently. But there are other things that we, I think in the future we will start looking at. So one-step sequential media, I'm gonna talk a little bit of microfluidics in the end. We saw a great talk by, by Rick Paulson, who even showed us the, the, the soccer ball before, and he showed us how complex actually the, the uterine environment is. But you have to remember, we're growing these media in, in water, basically. They're not growing in water in the, in the uterus or the fallopian tube. It's a very viscous solution. So we haven't even really attacked that, that type of aspect yet about actually looking at viscosity of media. And there are indications that the viscosity will have actually profound changes on the embryo in terms of actually how it compacts. So, so these are things I think in the future we have to look at. Co-culture was a thing of the past, but maybe we need to revisit it. Gas phases, new incubators, all these are things we will eventually look at. And, and these are sort of the factors that we, we will cover eventually when we're looking at culture media. And I won't go into all of these, but, but there are a lot of things that we really don't have an, a, a really good understanding of. But what we do know is, what we thought we knew really well, was the metabolism of embryo. It's a slam dunk. We know this happens at the cleavage stage and this happens at the blastocyst stage. But can we learn more about the metabolic signatures of the human blastocyst? is there more ju than just this metabolic shift? So we've been very interested in that for quite a few years, and we've been looking at various discovery platforms, and most of these platforms we've, we've aimed to look at to sort of try to predict which embryo is the best one. And I won't go into that because it's a very different talk, but one of the technologies I'm gonna talk about is a fluorescence, a semi-non-invasive technology based on looking at the, at, at the metabolism of embryos. So, we know that the embryo actually shows differences in, in its developmental capabilities. And actually in 1980, Jean-Paul Renard and Yves Menizo showed in cow embryos that embryos that had a higher glucose uptake, bovine embryos, led to a higher rate of pregnancy or ongoing pregnancies. And um, this is a, a study done Henry Lees and colleagues did these studies in mice and other species, but David Gardner and Michelle Lane did this study many years ago now, so it's more than 10 years, which is amazing, showing that actually if you looked at the embryo's metabolism before you transferred it, so these are blastocysts, and it had a high glucose uptake, it was more likely to, read, to lead to a pregnancy than ones that had a low, preg low glucose uptake. So we know the metabolic signature of a blastocyst at least and its glucose uptake is, is imperative for it to actually be viable or not viable. 
Problem is, this technique, there's probably only a handful of people in the world that can actually do the technique that measures glucose uptake. So we've always been looking for methodologies that would allow us to look at, at metabolism in another way, a faster way. So we've been working now for several years on this technology called fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy. It's a, a laser-based technique, and it allows us to metabolically and non-invasively look at the, the signature of embryos and oocytes. So this is just a quick video. This is just showing, this is a, a stylized video showing how we can actually grow embryos under this. And this initial paper, we did a lot of work on mouse embryos. We showed a lot of characteristics of how metabolism works. We repeated a lot of the old studies and validated them. But we also showed that this metabolic uh, technique was actually safe. So we could, we, could, we could grow embryos under the microscope for five or six days, mouse embryos, transfer them back to, to pseudo-pregnant mice, and get fetuses and they all look normal, they weren't fluorescing differently or had a weird activity, but they, they were all normal. So we were quite um, confident that this technique worked. So fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, it's not just looking at the intensity that you're used to looking at fluorescence images. It's a, it's a, a novel, non-invasive method of embryo imaging that gives us more than just the, the, just the fluorescence intensity, but gives us actually the time and molecule will stay in an excited state. And what we're looking at, the two candidates we're looking at with um, non-invasive metabolic screening is NADH and FAD, which are both key factors in, in mitochondrial uh, function. I won't go into this in, 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 a, in a great lot of detail. We all believe mitochondria hopefully are very important. If you don't, then I think you've got a problem. Uh, <laughs> you could get rid of your mitochondria and you're not gonna do very well. But mitochondria are integral to our energy source. And it's the same for an embryo. One of the cool things though, is two of the things, the key factors in mitochondrial metabolism, NADH and FAD, they both do this thing called autofluorescence. So when you excite them with a, with a laser, they actually emit fluorescence. And there's quite a lot of uh, factors in the body, in cells that actually do this. So we can do these non-invasive screenings without actually adding a molecule in there to try to make the embryo fluoresce. So it's, they're autofluorescing when we excite them. So what do we look at? I won't go into this completely, but we look at when an embryo fluoresces, or NADPH or, N or FAD, and, and how long it takes to actually get down from the excited state. And we can measure these really geeky things about mitochondria. So in total, we look at the brightness, we look at the lifetime a, a, a molecule stays in an excited state, how long it takes to get to a, a, a shorter state, or to, to deflore defluoresce, and how, what the lifetime overall is of that fluorescence. So for NADH and FAD, we get, we get four parameters of their, of their existence within the mitochondria, if you want. And we also get a thing called the redox potential, which is the, the F NADH divided by FAD, which is important also in, in knowing how the embryo functions. So we can measure all these parameters and we get a lot of information about how an embryo develops. You can see here on the left-hand side is NADH, on the right-hand side of FAD, the first thing you see, FAD is not as bright as the NAD. And you can see around the time of eight cell stage, it changes over and it's actually brighter. So this is a really cool way of repeating this experiment that was done 30 years ago. So that's exciting, but uh, it just shows us we can do this non-invasively and actually validates a lot of the work that, that Henry Lees did for many, many years. So that's nice, but we, we actually get much more information. And I'm going to talk now about what we found out about blastocysts, how human blastocysts metabolise in, in not just this simple way that we thought, but actually how clever they are in actually using metabolic uh, factors in, in the culture media. So these are two papers that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be like uh, Jürgen and say I'm not going to look at the client. <laughs> but these are, these are, this is how we do it. So we take human blastocysts and we just scan through them. So this is just an indication of just scanning through them and we take three sections, basically we focus on the inner cell mass, above and below the inner cell mass. And this is what we found out. We, we looked at, at many blastocysts, these were all donated, discarded blastocysts, they were from 137 patients. So we could look at, at blastocysts overall, we could look at differences between blastocysts from the same patient. And we could look at variability between like the trophectoderm scans and that that we did. And what did we find out? So the first thing we saw, and we sort of knew before, 
Inner cell mass and trifecta derm actually metabolize in a very, very different way. So we have this big concept that they all use glucose, but they use it in very different ways. And if you look at, if you look at the metabolism, metabolic signature of, of the inner cell mass and trifecta derm, we find that the inner cell mass and trifecta derm are very different in terms of how they metabolize. And you can virtually, if you look at the blue dots, um, unfortunately this isn't working, but if you look at the blue dots, oh, there you go. If you look at the blue dots of the inner cell mass and the orange or yellow are, are trifectoderm, you can virtually draw a line between the, the, the combined inner cell mass and trifectoderm. So they are very different in the way they metabolize and so they have different metabolic states. What about metabolic states of trifectoderm inside and outside? It's the same thing. If you look at the inside and outside of, of, of trifectoderm, you can see the energy they need to expend is very different from the ones that are outside, the outside of the zona pellucida versus those inside the zona pellucida. We even see different, so we see very different states of the, of the trifectoderm. We also see very different states from what we thought was the same embryo. So if you grade all these embryos and say, this is an AA, this is a BB, this is a CC, what's fascinating is that there's no significant difference in the metabolic state of these embryos. So an AA may have exactly the same metabolic signature as a CC embryo, for those of you that understand the, the, the scoring of embryos. So embryo metabolic state and morphology could offer synergistic information for embryo selection. What happens when we grow them? And this is one of the things that really fascinated me. So we see differences in, in the way embryos expand. So we see that they're obviously changing their energy production as they expand. And the thing that always fascinated me is that regardless if it's a, an AA on day five or a BB or an AA on day six, it doesn't matter. There's, a, there's an internal clock in the embryo that tells it it's day five and tells us at day six, regardless of its morphology. So the embryo knows in itself that actually it's gonna change from day five to day six. So it's like a clock mechanism that drives metabolism. So one of the things we're also interested in is the ploidy status. Can you look at metabolic signatures and see if an embryo is euploid or aneuploid? So we actually published this. Uh, it was Jamin Sharatel, and I'm still having problems clicking this. Oh, there you go, it's very slow. Um, so you, we do see a difference. This was, this was like just a few embryos, but actually we've done many more to this date. And we now see about an 81% or 0.8 um, uh, ROC curve analysis, area under the curve analysis, of showing embryos that are euploid or aneuploid in association with their, with their, embryo, develop, with their embryo metabolism. The sad thing is, and I'm not showing it here, when we do this and we've done a random, we've done a, a pilot clinical trial looking for embryo metabolism and seeing if they go to pregnancy or not, we're not able to see a difference in pregnancy related to the metabolism. We can see everything about a blastocyst, but we can't tell you with its, with its metabolism if it's going to be pregnant or not. And we've done over 100 transfers. So I won't go through all these techniques, I'll just go right through to the end. I think you can see these. It, so the metabolic signature of the, of the human blastus is, it's much more than, than this switch from, from glucose or from lactate and pyruvate to glucose. So it, it re readily uses high oxygen levels of, of glu high levels of, of uh, glucose. It also has a really high uh, anal of a consumption of oxygen and it still converts half of that glu glucose to, to lactate actually. It's consumed by lactate and it performs aerobic glycolysis. All right. But it's much smarter than that. It does this, it has a distinct metabolic signature between the inner cell mass and trifectoderm. It has distinct metabolic states outside and inside the trifectoderm. It knows that it's actually not dependent on its actually stage or its morphology. So different morphology embryos have the same actually meta metabolic signature. The, the strange thing is there, there is this switch from day five to day six where the embryo knows it's at its, its, its fifth day of development and it knows it's in the sixth day of development. And finally, the metabolic state may be associated with its ploidy status. And, and then it creates its own metabolic environment and signaling mechanism through lactate during implantation. So metabolism is much, much more than what we're doing. And to be honest, we're, we're really, 
we're relying on the embryo in these, in these culture media that we use. So maybe we can do this better. So the, the lab of the future will be, I think, very different. We'll have new technologies. We've spoken about automation, artificial intelligence. We've spoken about microfluidics. All these things will come together to possibly change the way we culture embryos. And we've already seen automation in the lab. And this is a paper published nearly 15 years ago now by David Gardner and a group at, at, at MIT, where they actually, they, they looked at the embryo and they actually cultured it in a specific microfluidic chip and they could measure inside and outside what was going on in the embryo. And Gary Smith has obviously done many, many years of work. He, in the early 2000s, uh, they, looked at, they, they looked at these types of systems. But microfluidics may be the answer to some of the, the way we culture embryos in the future. And we can picture that this future lab is actually going to be reliant on microfluidics. And, and we will be doing a lot of things with microfluidics, sperm preparation, egg retrievals, as we saw earlier in Jose's talk, embryo culture, freezing, but they'll all be driven by, uh, by input using metadata of the patient with artificial intelligence. So how do you think we will culture embryos in the future? It's interesting because we had a lot of discussion about personalised uh, patient care earlier, but I think in the future, it'll be actually personalised embryo care. So you can imagine in the future, if this works, oops, can you run that video or? There you go. So imagine each embryo will be in its own little well, and through AI, we will actually be adjusting personally for each embryo how it will actually be consuming certain factors within the media. So we won't have a sequential media, we'll have just a continuous media change that will cater for the embryo when it's at the one cell stage, the four cell stage, and as, that, as it's getting to the blastocyst stage. So you can see these media will be controlled, the media will be taken out and tested maybe in some way, maybe for DNA or other factors, maybe metabolic signatures. We'll take an image of the embryo and all that personalised information will control how that embryo is being fed by its culture media and how we assess it to, to know whether we're going to freeze it or not or transfer it in the future. So I believe microfluidics eventually will come into the system and how we will grow embryos. It's going to take quite a while and there's already a number of companies working on this and hopefully at some stage we'll get to that stage. So finally, I get to come to San Diego and give these talks um, and this comes from sharing a lot of drinks at pubs with people, so much smarter than I am. So these are the people, Marta did a lot of the work on, uh, she did her PhD on, on the FLIM. Uh, these are people we've collaborated with for many times. Jamin Shard is a fellow, an REI fellow in our department, or he's not with us anymore, but he did a lot of the annuplody uplody work. Uh, Tim and Dan have done a lot of work on, uh, on embryo metabolism and the FLIM system and, and some uh, long-term collaborators there that, uh, that are also included. And of course, uh, the IVF lab who does a lot of the hard work and lets me walk around and travel around. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me.